بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه One of the greatest imams of the Tabi'een in the second century, his name Imam Khalid bin Ma'dan, رحمه الله تعالى رضي الله عنه وأرضاه said, إذا فتح لأحدكم باب فليسرع إليه فإنه لا يدري متى يغلق عنه. If Allah opens a door for you, an opportunity to do something good, something khair for your akhirah, then do not hesitate. Uh, you must rush to it right away because you don't know when this door will be closed and if you are going to have another opportunity or not. This shows us the importance of uh, rushing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taking advantage of the opportunities that Allah gives the believers in this life to increase their rewards with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have another hadith that shows us the importance of that too, narrated by Sayyidina Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu wa arda. Said one time the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with his sahaba. Then he said, alayhi salatu was salam, عُرِضَتْ عَلَيَّ الْأُمَمْ Allah presented the nations before me, and then فَقِيلَ لِي هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكَ And they said to me, this is your nation. سَبْعُونَ أَلْفًا مِنْهُمْ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ Seventy thousands among them will enter the Jannah without hisab, without questions. The moment Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa finishing saying this hadith, one of the Sahaba was sitting in a, next to him, alayhi salatu wasalam. His name, Ukashatu ibn Mahsun, said to the Prophet, sallam, Ana minhum ya Rasulullah, am I among them, ya Rasulullah? Am I one of them? The Prophet sallam, said, Yes, you are. Right away, when he finishes, the second Sahabi said the same thing, said, What about me? Am I one of them, ya Rasulullah? The Prophet sallam, sallam, said, Sabakaka biha Ukasha. No, Ukasha took it before you. What is the difference between Ukasha and the other Sahabi? Why Ukasha has the opportunity to get this and the other Sahabi didn't? The reason the difference between Ukasha and the other Sahabi is the one second only. That was second made Ukasha win that opportunity, but the other Sahabi didn't get it. So that it shows us the importance of one second of hesitation or waiting towards a'malul akhirah. See one second how it could make a big difference towards the akhirah. That's why when you look in the Quran and read the ayat and the surahs and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see always Allah is pushing us towards rushing towards the good deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَرْجِعَكُمْ So rush towards the khayrat. Uh, all of you will be returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the other ayah, Allah said, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ وَسَارِعُوا And rush, hurry towards the maghfirah of your Lord and the Jannah. And, and to rush towards the maghfirah, it means you need to rush to the ta'a obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the good deeds, because the good deeds it will make you reach the maghfirah, the maghfirah will make you reach Jannatullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, Allah is telling us here in this ayah to take the opportunity of all the, uh, to take the advantage of all the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in this life to do a good deed for Allah. But the question is, why do we have to rush and not hesitate towards the good deeds? What is the reason of that? The reason of that is because our life in this dunya is limited. So because of that reason, when you get an opportunity from Allah, you shouldn't hesitate. If Allah opens the door for you to do something good, to help someone or to donate or to pray or to read Quran or to do any khair, any khair for your akhirah, if Allah gives you the opportunity of that, you can't think it twice or hesitate about it because you don't know if you are going to get another opportunity like this or not and when that's going to happen. Or you don't know if you are going to be alive when the other opportunity comes back. So the life in the, the, on, on earth is very limited. So because of that, we must take advantage of every chance we get from Allah. If you see Allah opens the door for you to do something good, 
then just go for it. Look at the conversation that Allah says in the Quran between him and those who will find themselves in the judgment ending up to the hellfire wal billah. What they ask Allah for? They ask him for one thing that Allah gives them the chance to go back to where they came from, which is the dunya, which is here right now. Why? Because they say to Allah, we will do better. So just give us the opportunity. If you just make us live a little bit longer, if you send us back, we will do good. We will do good. And then Allah said, But I already gave you the chance. I already gave you the life on earth. And I gave you the opportunities to do the good. I send the messengers, I send the books, I send the guiders, I, I send the opportunities for you, but you choose not to take it. So you cannot go back now. So what is important in here? It's not how long you will live in this life. The important is how fast you will be responding to the opportunities that comes to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you going to respond right away if Allah gives you the opportunity to do something good? Are you going to say, I'm not interested now, I'll do this later. Or I have something else to do. Or, or, or would, you, would you run to it and, and see it as a great gift from Allah? Oh, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me this opportunity to do, to do good. I will take it. Alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah. Because every time you respond to these opportunities and chances that comes from Allah, Allah will increase it to you because Allah knows that you will respond. So with every response, you make your door of receiving these opportunities wider and bigger. And with every time you reject it, you reject it, then your doors towards these opportunities get closer and closer until it will be shut completely. So that is very important to understand it. So that's why Rasulullah said in the hadith, the hesitation it could be in everything but the actions of the akhirah so that means when it comes towards the akhirah towards allah no 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 i'm not gonna think about it and do my calculations so should i donate or not or what's important and so on no i don't think like that when it comes to the akhirah i am ready to go ahead you see, so the hesitation is accepted in everything. But when it comes towards the Akhirah, the one who hesitates and wants to calculate it and think about it will be among the losers because you will lose the blessings of this opportunity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Abu al-Hasan al-Jurjani radiallahu anhu arda said, Ma jiktu Ibrahim ibn Hamad illa wajattuhu yaqra aw yusalli. I never visited. These are the scholars of the second century, the tabi'in with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They said, uh, or the first century, they said, I never came to visit Imam Ibrahim ibn Hamad. Every time I visit him, I see him either he is praying or reading Quran. So all the time. So they filled up their time with the Quran, with Ibadatullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the other also Imam says, Hamad ibn Salama rahimahullah ta'ala says, Ma atayna Salman al-Taymi fi sa'atin yuta'u Allahu azza wa jalla fiha illa wajadnahu muti'a. In kana fi sa'ati salatin wajadnahu musalliya. Wa in kana fi, wa in lam takun sa'atu salatin, wajadnahu imma mutawaddi'an aw ha'idan maridan aw mushayyan li janazatin aw qa'idan fi al-masjid. He said every time we visit Imam Sulaiman al-Taymi, we find him always occupying himself in ibadatullah. Always doing good and doing khair. Always obeying Allah. He said if it was the time of salah, such as Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, any Salah, we will see him praying. If it was, if it was in time of Salah, then we see him always, either he's performing a wudu, purifying himself, or visiting someone who's sick, or following a janaza, a funeral, or sitting in the masjid, doing his ibadah, his dhikr. Uh, we used to think how a man like this could disobey Allah, could commit a sin. And that's true. Why? Because he occupied his time and his life, filled it up with ibadatullah. So there is no such free time, I don't know what to do. So they used to look the time for them, it means opportunity to do good for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not like they sit, if Allah gives me an opportunity, I will see to respond or not. No, no. They used to look at 
every minute in their life, every hour, as opportunity. I'm alive in this hour. That means this is opportunity to do good for my Akhirah. So that's how they used to look at it. If we get ourselves to look at the time itself as opportunity to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do good, then this will make a big difference in our life. But if we start looking at the time as has no value in our life, then we will lose our life and we won't be able to build for our next life. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from this mawaidah and give us the ability to benefit from our time, our time, every hour of our time, and then attach it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make every hour in every hour in our life adds blessings to our akhirah. Allahumma ameen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. When they say good people make good places, nowhere is that more true than at Noon Academy. Being away from the messages has definitely been hard on all of us, but being away from the people who enrich our lives has even been harder. Everyone who has ever met Sheikh Walid knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mashallah, there's something about his demeanor and his care for the community that is felt by everyone around him. Sheikh Walid makes you feel seen and understood, whether you're a man, a woman, or a child. When he gives us so much, we naturally want to give him the best of us in return. One year, when Sheikh Walid called to ask to me, for me to be a photographer at an event, I was extremely busy that weekend. And I told him, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to make it. Yet somehow, in some way, I ended up at the event with all my camera gear ready to go for his event. Another example is when Sheikh Walid performed my nikah. It is a moment that I will cherish and remember. And he spoke from the heart and all of his words touched everyone in the room. He made a beautiful day even more beautiful. The pandemic has forced us to think seriously about what's at stake within our communities. The loss of Noon Academy could mean the loss of the places where beautiful relationships are made and maintained. Think about that. I know everyone watching feels the same way about Sheikh Walid, his family, and the community they've established at Noon Academy. Keeping it alive will require all of our help. Please donate generously to Noon Academy. Jazakallah. Welcome to Shireen Sweets. Indulge yourself with our decadent gourmet treats. We use high quality Belgian chocolate, artfully crafted for all your occasions. Try us for your next special event. You can follow us on Instagram at shireen.sweets or place your order via email at shereensweets2020 at gmail.com. We look forward to serving you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today, we will resume the epic and long forgotten story of the Muslim mariner, Jonghae. We start by asking, why? Why was Zhonghe chosen above everyone in China to lead the famed treasure fleet? The answer? He was a seven foot tall man with a commanding presence. He was the most trusted subject of the emperor and his qualities was seen in his role as head of construction and head of servants in the Ming Palace. He is known to have managed for a time the construction of the Forbidden City. 
and manage the extension and fortification of the Great Wall of China. But still, removing him from these positions did not sit well with the Mandarin elites. When the question was addressed to the emperor himself, he said, None paled in comparison to Zhongke, not even close. And so, at the age of 34, he commanded the largest fleet the world has ever seen by the 15th century. A man who has never been at sea. This was no problem, because he could speak Arabic, and all ship navigation in these regions were already mastered by the Muslims and recorded, so it was very easy for him to just follow the instructions. Moreover, he recruited navigators from Muslim populated parts of China, such as Gangzhou, which apparently was inhabited by Muslims who settled there on trade missions. Trading and sailing are qualities that the Muslims were renowned for across the world, and academics agree that they were in fact the only people who were capable of such technological feats. The maps that the Muslims used and created on this voyage can still be used today with accurate results. If the shore was out of sight, no problem. The stars would be used to navigate. During his later voyages, he went to Aden in Yemen, and from there he completed his Hajj. His purpose in Yemen was to collect luban or frankincense, which has many properties described in Islamic medical texts. During even later travels, he visited Kenya to a town called Malindi, but 15 kilometers south to a town called Gede. There shows evidence of his presence there. He would bring presents to the Muslim communities he visited, decorating them with Chinese porcelain, which can be found in a 600-year-old ruin of a mosque. On an island off the coast of Kenya, there's a tribe that some Ming sailors married into that still trace their lineage and some cultural practices to the 15th century Chinese practices. After going to Melindi, Zhang was gifted a giraffe which completely put the mandarins at home at all. They had no way to name it. What is this? They ended up making paintings of it, writing lots of poetry. And some in mainland China even worshipped it. This was one of the last voyages Zhang He ever commandeered, as the mandarins found that they were going into debt, and these voyages cost over six billion dollars in today's USD. And with that, the emperor and friend of Zhong He died. And his son took the mantle of emperor. But he had different designs upon the future of China, which resulted in the attempt to destroy all the books, the logs, the evidence of his voyages, and destroyed even the Grand Fleet, including the evidence of his existence. And even the claims that Zhang He discovered America before Christopher Columbus, only a few decades before him, forever lost. It is only from the writings of Muslims and the places that he visited that were preserved, and that we can learn from him. But in China, his memory is erased for the most part. It's only recently where China started to revive his character amongst the Chinese population. But Zhong He left a praiseworthy legacy despite him being forgotten for most of China's history. It was him who improved the trade routes between the heart of the Muslim world and the Orient. And he has even some of his own items that he injected into the economy circulating for over 200 years. His actions encouraged lots of immigration towards Southeast Asia, and many Muslim communities were founded. And he built hundreds of mosques still in use today. The people celebrate him both Muslim and non-Muslim for the great efforts he did both in defeating evildoers, harming the people, and creating a healthy economic environment for the people to enjoy. Insha'Allah, we hope to continue this history segment and more. So make sure to subscribe and stay tuned.
Assalamu alaikum noon families. Please visit our website at cdesigns.net for all your jewelry and hijab pin needs. Our website is sidesigns.net. Once again, it's s-i-d-e-s-i-g-n-s.net. In the month of February, 50% of all sales will go to noon to help for education purposes. We thank you in advance for your support. Jazakallah and have a wonderful day.